This tutorial will look at how Grasshopper can interface with Rhino geometry. We'll see how to load geometry from Rhino into Grasshopper and how to create Rhino editable geometry with Grasshopper in order to create useful tools to aid your modeling process. So for this, we're going to start with a blank Grasshopper document. So make sure you fire up Grasshopper and we're going to be using a base Rhino file called 01lotlayout.3dm that should be in the source files. Um, and what we're going to do is build a little utility that will allow us to take these simple uh, single polyline or line, uh, sort of a diagram of a street network, and turn it into something more detailed with, you know, sort of street widths and sidewalks and so on. So we need to figure out a way to get this curve geometry into Grasshopper so we can manipulate it. So far in these tutorials, we've only created geometry dynamically using the nodes and components in the Grasshopper interface. So in order to do this, we're going to grab one of these param objects. So we are going to first grab a curve param. And what we want in this curve param um, is the boundary of the site. That's the first piece of geometry that we need. Um, and as a good practice, um, it's a good idea to right click one of these uh, params that's going to store some particular piece of information and rename it as a way of annotating what kind of geometry or what, what it's supposed to be doing within your definition. So I'm going to right click it, highlight CRV and type in boundaries so that I know that this is sort of the boundary that I'm going to be working with. And I'm going to right click and choose set one curve. And then Grasshopper will disappear and will be thrown into sort of a mini Rhino command uh, that's asking for the curve or edge to reference. Make sure that this mode says reference. If it doesn't, you'll click it. But let's choose reference and then click this curve. And right away, it changes from orange to gray. And we can see if we hover over it that it now contains a polyline curve. Now, it will probably show as a sort of red line in your interface. If it doesn't, that's uh, due to a setting called bump preview over here. So if you don't see a sort of faint red around the thing that got highlighted or a green when you select it, then go ahead and turn on bump preview, but it'll probably be on by default. Um, and now we can start to do things with this geometry. So I want to create a surface from this curve boundary. And for that, I'm going to go to the surface tab. And I'm going to go to freeform and find boundary surfaces. I'm going to plug this in and right away we should see in the Rhino preview a sort of solid surface that's been constructed based on that boundary. Now, if I select this curve in Rhino and use the points on command in order to turn on control points, or you can toggle this with the F10 key, um, I can now select these control points and move them around. And what you'll see is that the surface dynamically updates. So this is a live link to this piece of Rhino geometry, which makes it really useful. We can create sort of hybrid editing environments where we're doing some manual work in the Rhino context, but automatically processing it to do more advanced things in the Grasshopper context. So we can also load multiple curves at a time. So what I want to do is split this surface into distinct regions using these center lines as the splitting geometry. So I'm going to need another curve param over here under params curve. And this one I'm going to call street center lines. And I'm going to right click and choose set multiple curves and use a window select to pick all of these. So before we did set one curve, uh, this time we used set multiple curves in order to load in a list of values. Um, when you do this, you can also just click multiple times and then hit enter when you're done, um, but it works just as well with a window select. So what we want to do is take these surfaces and split them with these lines. We're going to use the surface split component, which lives under the intersect tab over here. So uh, under physical, the surface split component will take a surface as its first input and a curve or list of curves as its second input. And even though it doesn't look like much has changed, if we use a text panel to investigate this, you'll see that it's now broken it into many surfaces. So it's basically created a separate region uh, where any of these sort of surfaces uh, are being split by these center lines. 
So what we want to do is now offset these a consistent amount. Um, so we're going to grab the curve offset component under curve util offset. Uh, we should be able to uh, take these and offset them. Now, you'll notice that curve offset takes a curve as its input, but we have our surfaces. Um, what we're going to do is rely on the fact that Grasshopper is generally pretty smart about automatically converting data types. So uh, if you have a planar surface and pass it through a curve parameter, um, it will automatically translate that surface into the curve representing the boundary of that surface. Uh, there are lots of nice things like this in Grasshopper where it'll automatically convert to the right thing, but it's also something to watch out for because if you're not paying close attention to the kinds of data that your components are looking for, it can still calculate but maybe not give you the result you were expecting. So I'm going to plug this in and I'm going to create a slider uh, that's going to be my offset distance and I want a negative offset distance because I want these to offset inwards from their boundary. Uh, so under the maths tab we're going to grab the negative operator uh, and then we're going to create a slider and here I'm just going to double click and type the value 0.5 uh, that's a quick shortcut in order to automatically create a slider that's pre-populated at this value. I'll plug it in and offset it, and you'll see something funny is happening over in the Rhino context. When I drag this slider, some curves are offsetting inwards and some are offsetting outwards. Um, it, this is something that trips up a lot of beginners. Um, what is happening is that the curve offset takes the general direction of each curve uh, as whether it's clockwise or counterclockwise to figure out which way it's oriented and whether or not a negative offset is inwards or outwards from the perspective of the view we're looking at. Um, so we need to do something in between before we offset this curve in order to force it to offset in a consistent direction. And I have a trick for that that I use quite frequently. Um, there's a component called flip curve. So under curve util flip curve, we're going to, again, automatically convert these to curves. And we're going to specify a guide curve. Um, now, it took me a long time to kind of figure out how this works exactly. It works differently for open curves and closed curves. But in the case of closed curves, the position of uh, the guide curve doesn't matter at all. You can just use a circle, a default circle, as a guide curve. And it will cause all the closed curves that you pass into it to now be consistently oriented counterclockwise, which is the default orientation of a circle. So if I now take these flipped curves and plug them into the offset component, now our offsets are all nice and consistent. They all go inwards. We can also see that if we move these lines around, um, that our sort of general boundaries uh, are affected. So we can kind of use this as a quick way to adjust our modeling. Again, we can use points on or F10 to kind of edit the shaping of these curves. And automatically, all of these sort of offsets are being calculated for us. So you can start to see how something like this is quite useful. Now, right now, we're seeing a lot of stuff that we don't actually need or want. Um, we have seen this a little bit before, but in order to control the preview of grasshopper geometry in the Rhino context, you can control it all together with the view settings. So this will say, don't draw any grasshopper geometry in Rhino. Um, you can say, only draw wireframes, so this won't show that surface fill. Uh, or shaded preview geometry will show everything in this kind of light red default. Um, I think we also already saw uh, this second mode for only drawing preview for selected objects, which means that I only see the things that are highlighted, the only the things that I'm selecting in the Grasshopper interface previewed in Grasshopper, which is a great tool for kind of debugging. Um, but often we may want to actually just control the visibility of everything. So if you select a bunch of components like these and right-click the canvas, you can choose preview off, and then only the ones that are this kind of lighter gray that have preview enabled will show up in the Rhino context. So that's the way that, uh, again, if I right-click this circle and turn on preview, we see the circle, but we don't really want the circle. We're just using it as kind of a guide. We don't really need it in our display, so we can hide it. So it's a good idea to get in the habit of kind of tidying up the display of the geometry that you're working with. So the next thing we want to do um, 
is maybe create a second offset with a different value so we can start to create like a sidewalk condition. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and copy paste this entire group. So I've got my slider, my negative, and my offset selected. I'm going to do a copy paste, control C, control V. And I maybe I'll make this value a little bit larger. So I'm going to delete this slider and use that shortcut to do a larger value, 1.5. When you use this shortcut, it automatically sizes the range of the slider to be between 0 and the next largest power of 10. So it'll always take you up to like 10 or 100 or 1,000, which is pretty useful. Um, so now we can offset a little bit further. And what we want to do is maybe round the edges a little bit of one of these sets of offset curves. Um, so let's take these, and we're going to apply a fillet. You've probably seen the fillet command in Rhino. There's a corresponding grasshopper component. Uh, it lives here under curve util. I'm going to feed in these curves. And I'm going to specify a fillet value. And I'm just going to double click and do 0.7, let's say, in order to populate that. And again, I don't want to see the unfilleted version of these curves. I just want to see the filleted version. And I'm going to right click this guy and turn off preview. And so I can now control the amount of that fillet. And you know, as I'm manipulating my Rhino geometry, everything automatically calculates. Now, the last thing I want to do is create some surfaces that I can use. So. Uh, I need to create a surface that represents the sort of inner lot. So I'm going to use the same component I used before, this boundary surfaces component from the surface tab, freeform boundary surface, and plug it in. And it will create a surface from each one of those boundaries. And lastly, I want to create a surface in between the sort of edge of the site and this rounded sidewalk boundary. So we're going to use the merge component from sets list, or sorry, I think it's under tree uh, merge, and take our filleted curve and our, uh, our other offset over here. And because of the data structure that we're working with here, uh, this is going to maintain separate lists for all of those pairs of curves. So we're getting a bunch of lists with two items apiece, which are going to be the inner curve and the outer curve, which means that if we make a copy of this boundary surface component and feed it in, because it accepts lists, it will just create a surface in between those pairs of curves. So now those surfaces exist in Grasshopper, um, but they do not exist in the Rhino environment. I can't click on those surfaces. I can't extrude those surfaces. I can't do anything with them. Um, so there's a concept in Grasshopper called baking, which is essentially the process by which you take Grasshopper geometry and you bring it back into Rhino. So I'm going to create some layer names in our Rhino document. I'm going to say sidewalk is one layer and lot is another. And I'm going to click the sidewalk layer to make it active. And I'm going to highlight this boundary surface, right-click the canvas, and choose Bake. You can also right-click the component directly, which gives you a few more options. Um, but I tend to do it this way. So right-click the canvas, choose Bake. And now, even if I disable Grasshopper Preview, you can see that, and I'll switch to a shaded view, it's actually created these surfaces. These are now objects that I can use in my Rhino modeling. So this is super useful. Um, but the thing that you'll notice is that they are no longer parametrically tied to my driving geometry. So if I turn on Grasshopper Preview, this has updated dynamically because I moved that line. Um, but the surfaces that are baked, once they're baked, they no longer have any sort of associative or parametric relationship to the geometry that's driving them. So that's why it's a good idea to organize your bakes in layers, is that I can now clear this out and bake it again. Uh, and I'm going to go to Lot and do the same. And now we've got some nice usable geometry that you know we could start to extrude up into uh, into buildings or start modeling with or use for a rendering or a graphic. Uh, you can use this geometry with Make 2D now, like Grasshopper geometry normally won't show up in a Make 2D. Um, so 
this basic round trip of sort of loading driving geometry into parameters and then baking the resulting geometry is a sort of standard pattern for constructing your own tools. We're going to look at one more way to bring geometry into Grasshopper from Rhino. Uh, for this one, we're going to need the file o2parcels.3dm, which should be in the source files. And this is a file that just has a bunch of parcel boundaries on a layer called parcels. And so rather than using a curve param to grab all of this geometry directly, we're going to grab all the geometry on the parcels layer. Uh, the way this will work is also set up such that if new geometry gets added to the parcels layer, it'll come in automatically. Now, in order to do this, uh, we're going to need to install a plugin. So we're going to be using a plugin called human. Uh, you should find a file called human.gha in the source files. So here's the file. And we are going to need to move this to a special directory. So if you go back to Grasshopper and choose File, Special Folders, Components folder, it will bring up a special directory in your user folder that is where all plugins get installed. So if we grab human.gha and make a copy of it over here, um, then it should be installed. Now, it won't show up immediately. There are two ways we can get it to show up. One is we can close Rhino and Grasshopper and restart the whole thing, or there's a shortcut where we can actually just drag this .gha file that we just installed from the libraries folder directly onto our Grasshopper window. So when we do this, there should be a new tab called human that shows up at the top. Now, I have a lot of tabs, so as I've said before, I keep mine in icons. You'll see this if you do that. You can always right-click and switch to that mode if you prefer, um, but that um, will allow you to install it. Now, you could also always just restart Rhino and uh, Grasshopper. So in order to load these curves in using human, there's a component under the human tab called the dynamic pipeline under reference. The dynamic pipeline takes in uh, three inputs, although you really are only generally concerned with two of them. One is a layer name which in this case is going to be the layer parcels. So we're going to create a text panel that just says parcels. And we have to be careful that this is case sensitive, so make sure to use capital P. And we need to also specify a type, which in this case is going to be curve, which we're also going to create a panel to store. So if you just type the word curve in a panel, and size it and plug it in, then you'll see that just like before when we did set multiple geometry, the geometry shows up with that red highlight preview indicating that it's been loaded into Grasshopper. So we now have a list of polylines. Now, what we're going to build is a little utility to visualize the area of each one of these parcels to give us sort of live data feedback in our modeling environment. So we need to be able to measure the area of this component or of these uh, curves. So uh, we're going to double click and search for the area component. This lives in the surface analysis tab. And if I plug in all these curves, I will get back a list of areas. You can just visualize those with a text panel and a series of points, which are the area centroids. Um, and what I want to do is be able to visualize this over the top of my drawing. So I'm going to use a special component from the display tab called text tag under dimensions. And if I supply these area centroids as the location and the areas as text, and I can turn off the preview of this area component like we saw earlier in order to visualize this, I will get live feedback on the areas of each one of these parcels. And if I use points on to modify them, let's say, so I, you know, maybe change the size of this parcel, then the area will update accordingly, which is really useful. Um, now, the difference between this method and what we saw before is that if I start adding new parcels, say, drawing one up here, as long as I'm on that parcels layer, then everything that gets added is automatically processed by the definition. So if I create new geometry, uh, it's automatically fed into the definition, which makes it very useful for these kind of dynamic modeling workflows. The one last thing I'll show you is we might want to see this in a better formatted 
uh, text string so that it's not just with these long decimal places. So we're going to format the text coming out of the area component using something called string format. So if you double click and search for format and plug the area value into the zero input and then plug T into T. Now it won't do anything yet because what this is expecting is a special format string, which is a piece of text which says how a number should be formatted. So go ahead and grab a panel and we're going to type something that'll seem a little bit peculiar, but uh, let's ju just bear with me and you'll see the result that we get. If you use curly brackets, uh, zero, colon, zero, comma, zero, close curly brackets and then space SF and hit enter or just exit out by clicking away and plug this in, you'll see that the data is now formatted with commas separating every three places like normal and showing an SF at the end. Now, I'm not going to get into a lot of detail about how these format strings are interpreted, but the file in the working files, uh, O2 Area Visualizer that this is based on, has a lot of information about how uh, the text format component is set up to work. So if you're interested in that, feel free to dig in and see a little bit deeper.